You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Rusty Furman. Rusty, how are we? Uh, okay, thanks. Um, great to do. Thanks for the invite, by the way. Yeah, anytime. And, um, you know, let's we'll crack on with it and see what comes out. Yeah. SAS soldier over 15 years. You've wrote a couple of books as well, which we'll plug straight away. You've got the regiment, 15 years in SAS. Yep. And we've got Go, 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 where you were in the Iranian embassy siege. Um, Jamie Bell played your part as well, is that correct? He plays a part in the film of Six Days, which is on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Number Six Days, numeral six. And um, Jamie plays me in the film. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Where can people buy your books? Uh, normally, um, I do a lot of book signings. You know, I've just been up at the aviation over the weekend with, with Sue. But mainly, if they go to my website, if they purchase them off the website to the shop, mm-hmm. then I just sign them at home and dedicate them if they want and then post them out to people. So there's, that's the easiest way of doing it if they want to sign books, yeah. So www.rusty-firmin.com. So if people want a signed book, they can just go there. That's it, and I'll just sign them at home and send them. Yeah, because the SAS ones I've had on, they're all popular. People love the madness, because if we're all honest, SAS, so they're mad bastards. There's something different. He's a crazy, let's be honest, and <coughs> I've came across a few, and you would not think the shit that they've done because their eyes are so clear and as if they don't care. They had old Peter, is it McAleese? Peter McAleese, yeah. yeah. Just a mad old bastard. He's just (laughs) sitting in the old folks' home telling his stories. That's right. Just zero fucks given. There's no struggle with him. I said, do you struggle? He says, no, fuck it. No, I know Peter McAleese, yeah. Yeah. He's um, got some good stories under his belt. Solid, man. But before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start of my guests. Get a bit of understanding about you, Rusty, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I grew up in Carlisle, um, which, as you know, is on the border of Scotland, as we just discussed. But um, all those years ago, I had a pretty bad upbringing in as much that I didn't have a mother as such. Um, you know, she, she uh, got rid of me <laughs> at 14 months of age where I was adopted, um, so I never really knew a family life um, because I was passed around certain aunts, uncles over the years when I was at school um, <clears throat> without a proper, as I say, family life really. So from a very early age, I've had to stand on my own two feet and um, battle my way through um, up until... I first joined the army, which I didn't want to do at age 15. Is that to try and find a home? Um, Actually, I was forced into it by what was um, my father because he could see that he was an ex-forces guy himself, by the way, um, in the RAOC in those days. He could see that I was heading for the downhill slope at age 15. I had no nothing. I didn't have any discipline. I didn't care. Um, And really it's just down to your upbringing that, you know, if I was out at midnight, you know what, nobody would come looking for me. Um, I made my way home, ready for the next day, skip school as normal, like most of my colleagues did, just to get on with... You know, all I wanted to do at that age was be a footballer. Um, and I'll tell you why, because I remember watching Pelé at Skip a School in the 1958, I think it was, World Cup. And I thought, wow, you know. Um, and it was from that, I just wanted to play football, sport. I was always way out, but I was only five foot two and weighed seven stone when I went in the army. So the chances of making it in professional football at that age, and that's quite old, isn't it? You know, for a footballer, even 15, they picked up much younger than that these days. But that's all I wanted to do, sport, sport, sport. 
Uh, I got my way in the end, you know, grew a bit, um, and I did represent the British Army, which is the, you know, top semi-professional as you're going to get in my day in the UK. So as a footballer, I got what I wanted, but I had to join the army to get it, if you, if you, if you get yeah. what I mean. So I did pray for the British Army, and that's quite an honour. Um, so, yeah, I did get one wish, but to go into the army wasn't me. I was a long-haired Rolling Stone fan. Okay, and I mean long-haired Rolling Stones fan. Blue jeans, Cuban Hill boots, the lot. But I was only five foot two and I wanted to be bigger. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So I got there. But the first three months in the army, a junior leader regiment, Royal Artillery, I could have been gone if I could have got 50 pounds. That's what it was going to cost me to buy myself out of the army, 50 pounds. I couldn't get it. Therefore, the first three months came and went. And then um, when I went back to junior leaders after the Christmas break, that's when I started to get into football. Somebody realized I had a bit of talent um, and I started playing for the regiment and so on as a 15-year-old. And it went from there. How was that feeling, that abandonment feeling? Did you have that, oh, <clears throat> nobody cared, nobody loved you? Yeah. I mean, I didn't know what it was. You know, um, I was lucky actually to stay within the safe friends and family. But you're talking to somebody who's never sent a Mother's Day card in his life or a Father's Day card, but she didn't know them. So what I had, I had in front of me, but suffice to say, I think I was at something like 12 schools, 10 schools. So I never had a settled anything. And it was like, oh, we've had enough of him, we'll pass him on to somebody else. And, you know, not nastily, but that's what happened. But I got to live with it. And eventually, at 15, um, I could see that the army could become a family mm -hmm. because it is a close-knit. In my day in particular, it was close-knit. And they were my friends, and they were the people that I'd rely on because I had nowhere else to go, you know. Instead of going home on your break, what you call home, I'd go to one of my friends' <clears throat> houses with them and spend a, a week or two there. But there was never a feeling of anybody there looking after you. Put him in the army, get him out of the way, and life goes on. And that's how it was. Did you see that in the army, a lot of boys coming from the broken homes? Yeah, yeah, lots of my friends. Um, especially in Scotland. Did that make it easier? Um, we had something in common. Mm -hmm. And of course, we go out for a beer and stuff. You've got something in common. You're, not, you're trying to tread on eggshells. You can talk quite openly about everything. And um, yeah, a, a lot of people I know, um, certainly some of my friends that I met later on in life, they all came from um, bad backgrounds. And, you know, that's how it, that's how I come to deal with stuff. What was the training like back then for a 15-year-old, 16-year-old? <laughs> well, for me, it was a total shock <clears throat> because if you've got no discipline, you've got nothing. However, when they found out the guys who had no discipline, we got picked on a bit more. You could call it bullying these days, but I didn't mind that because I didn't understand anything different. And, you know, bullying now, if you shout at somebody, they go and cry in the corner. In my day, so what? You know, and it's, it's not nice, and I would never recommend bullying to anybody, but I put up with it because I was small. But as I got bigger, you know, I started to realize you don't have to put up with it. But you couldn't go and tell anybody. You start telling on people, you know, grassing them up if you like. Oh, he's picking on me. You'd be found out and it'd make it worse for you. So that's how, that's how I actually tackled it. So you can through bullying, does that feed you with like a fire or a hatred to then 
it either listen, it makes you a break share. I've spoke to an, a, enough individuals to understand a lot of people who've been absolutely broken by it. It's, no matter how strong you are, no matter if you join the SES, it can still affect you 30, 40, 50 years along the line. Do you yeah. feel as if it feed, fed you something to then push you to then do what you've done? Well, I've seen people fallen by the wayside for what you've just said. You know, it, it wasn't for them, they couldn't take it. Um, and the easy way out is to quit. And that's in anything sport, um, soldiering, whatever. The easy way out is to quit. But I didn't quit. Instead of trying to buy myself out of the army, I had a go at it and ended up spending 27 years in the army altogether. And 15 of them were in the SAS, and three and a half of them before that were in the commandos. So I put up with it. I took it, um, along with some of my good friends. Some of them are still around today. And um, <clears throat> that's how we tackled it. And as time went on, um, you grow stronger. You become a, a better leader because you've been through the, 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 the hard part. Now it's like oh, time to milk it. You know, it's my time. And that's exactly how I took my from day one to where I am now. I've got no intentions of quitting because I had to work hard to get to where I got to. And now it's my turn to maybe have a go at doing some other stuff. But I'm not going to stop and retire. That ain't going to happen. When did you start finding the confidence and the strength to fight back? Probably, um, probably just about as I was leaving junior leaders at the end of almost two years, joined at 15 and a half, left at 17 and a half, um, and knew that I could then pick what I wanted to do. I was put in junior leaders, I stayed there for two years, or I could have gone out. I've never been a quitter, never, hopefully never will be. So as I was going out at 17 and a half, in as a, they call it leaving a boy soldier to become a man soldier. But I wasn't 18, you know, you can't have a beer. <laughs> and guess what? That didn't happen. Yeah, it went the other way. We had a few beers, but you weren't allowed to at 18, you know, until you were 18. So I was going now back to what I wanted to do. And I went to a decent unit, which I picked myself, which is 4-9 Field Regiment Royal Artillery. But... That's where I met some of the good guys. They were ex-professional footballers who joined national service. And it was when national service were wrapping up. And when I went to 4-9 up in Barnard Castle, up in Canton Durham, um, when I really got into football up there, uh, I ended up captain in the team. These guys were ex-professionals who were doing national service. They did a couple of years. They went out of the army altogether. I carried on. And in 4-9 in particular, me, I was a tracksuit soldier. I could play football four or five times a week. Um, so I could soldier through the day, but I could still get off to play football. And the more football I played, the better I became. Were you a winger? Um, no, I played midfield and centre forward, first of all. Striker? Yeah. Yeah. Fast? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it, and then I ended up going back into this, like what was a sweeper role in those days, sort of marshalling people around and stuff. But I got it to do what I wanted. I represented the Gunners, which I don't mean Arsenal, by the way, but the Royal Artillery, I represented them. I was captain of the 49 Field Regiment team. I was playing for, for civilian teams. The same when I went to Germany. All I did was get into a tracksuit. Then I played for German teams. At the same time, I was playing for... Um, I didn't. I didn't want to do a lot of soldier in them days. Uh, I wanted to get into a tracksuit, and that's exactly what I did. I aimed it down those lines, and if it wasn't rugby and football, it ended up being cricket and stuff. Because you know what, well, the, the more sport you played, the less work you had to do. And people, you know, there, there's quite a few people that I met early on that did that. But I got to do what I wanted to do, and that was the main thing. So being told what to do. Um, I went down my route and thought, tracksuit, 
going to the tracksuit as much as I could. How was that feeling from a kid who's not got much kind of abandoned try getting bullied to them being a captain because I was captain of football teams and even putting a, it might sound fucking gay to some people but when you put a captain's armband on yeah. gives you some sort of purpose that you're a leader my team need me if the shit hits the fan I've got to pick it up how yeah. was that feeling as a young kid to go through and all that to them being a captain well I was yeah I was lucky because I, at the same time in those days when a fair amount of military training courses you had to do because you were in the artillery well, lucky enough, I had to work for them, but I got my, all mine very quickly, you know, um, which meant I could be promoted um, quite quickly. Um, and that is what I wanted to do. So I got courses out of the way, military courses, and then you put the, the shirt on, then you're captain, you know, um, and it's always nice to be in control if you can. And if you've got the respect of senior guys to me, but it didn't come down to that. They told me quite clearly it was about ability and where I was going. And, you know, when um, you, you know when you pick up the trophies, of which got loads and loads of them at that time, when you pick the trophies up and you're captain of the team, it's always that bit extra special feeling. I mean, nowadays you look at the football as professionals, you know, you just wonder what's going on, uh, apart from the money they get, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I got a lot of enjoyment out of doing what I did um, and the way I did it because I wasn't supposed to do that. I was too little. But I got up to about 5'11", fit, you know, and, and uh, I made myself that way. So that was me when soldiering really in the artillery was okay. But then I had other plans as I went along of which football played a part in how I did that. Because, you know, I've played for the commandos um, and I was captain of the SAS football team as well uh, over a couple of seasons. So that progressed from where I was, what I learned. But then I decided somewhere down the line, I need to do some soldiering here. And I then mixed and matched that. And that worked as well. So not only could I play football in the army, I played rugby, I played cricket, played for civilian clubs, you know, all of that type of stuff at the same time as being in the commandos and being in the SAS all the way through to the end of my career at the age 42, I was still playing football. So see when you've got rugby and football, were they not concerned that people would get injured? Yeah, but um, lucky enough... For, for a couple of years there, the colonel in the SAS in particular, um, he was our chairman. <laughs> but he was an ex-footballer himself, by the way. He's no longer with us. Um, but that, no, they, they weren't concerned about it, you know. Um, the fact is that we had a really good team, won most of the trophies, and um, a bit of prestige. That's in my day. Um so no, they weren't concerned about it. It's the same as going out for a run. You can get injured, play rugby, you can get injured. You know, you can get injured walking across the road, can't you? Mm -hmm. So nobody looked at it that way. It was you can't play, you know, because you're in the SAS. You can't play because you're military. No, it, it didn't work like that. It was, you know, that was all part and parcel of it. What age did you go for SAS selection? <clears throat> um, 27. Uh, 1977, yeah. What was that decision? Um, well, I'd been in the commandos, 2-9 commando, for three and a half years. But somebody saw something in me after um, not very long in the commandos, 2-9. And they put me straight onto training wing. And on training wing in the 2-9 commando, what you do is, I did my Royal Marine commando course as well at Limston. When I came back and joined the, the, the battery they said, we want you to go on training wing, which is quite, you, your job is to run around with the, the PT, you know, tops on. And um, your, your job is to train anybody coming in to the commandos to take them out. And we call it beast them. <laughs> Same as I'd been through. It's not bullying, it's called beasting, um, which you get a bit of a kick out of it when you do it. And you get a big kick out when you train somebody else and you think, well, I've been through that myself. So don't whinge, you know, 
So it's training them as they come in. I spent a couple of years doing that. Very fit, always out on the hills, always out running the roads with the new recruits, uh, passing them, failing them, as I'd been through it myself. And um, for me, it was um, what I wanted to do. Again, 90% of my time was in tracksuit, you know, just physical out on the rope, um, rope courses and stuff, teaching them and showing them how to get fit and pass their own sort of selection for uh, the commanders. But after a couple of years of doing that, um, I spoke to a friend of mine who had already gone for the SAS selection uh, the year before. Yeah, he went there the year before me, six months before me. And he said, well, he said, I've gone there. And he went from our broth, funny enough, um, he went from our broth across to, and then he came to see me in, in Plymouth. He said, well, I've I've done my selection, Rusty. I'm in B squadron due to SAS. I said, God. So I put in for it straight away. Um, and I did this summer selection of 77, six months after him. And he's one of the guys I trained to get fit. So I went there the following summer, requested, you know, you have to form, you don't get pushed there, you have to request. It's voluntary. You don't get thrown into the essay. So I went there on the summer of 77. And from that day, I went through the six month training. I'd already got my parachute wings and stuff because I was para trained. So that was the last couple of weeks off that. And I went through it, and by Christmas, I was in B Squadron as well, alongside as my mate. And so that was pretty much the sway. And if I'd left it much later than 27, um, it might have been futile. So 27 for me was, you know, I'd seen quite a bit at that age, certain tours of different places and stuff. I knew what it was about. Fit, yeah. As fit as I've ever been in my life. And, you know, um, and that's how it started. What tours did you do in the commandos? I, I didn't go very far because I was on training wing. My job, the first few months, um, there was a tour of Northern Ireland. But when I got the call to go on the course, uh, sorry, on the SAS course, towards the end, my, um, most of my stuff was in the SAS. Because I was on the training wing, they didn't really leave Plymouth because their job was continuously bringing people through because it was all arms commando, which means you could be, you know, a clerk, could be artillery, could be royal engineers, you could be uh, what was like ordnance corps. Any of them would come through Plymouth because they would have to do the beat up, as they call it where they all come in, they all get their kids thrown at them. You know, you go and find where you're sleeping. And uh, that's how it starts. So my job, along with, I think it was six of us all together on training wing, was to make sure that that side of it ran okay. So the two was that we did on that stint would be maybe confined, maybe to two years, some 18 months, some a bit longer. Um, so, and unfortunately, in the commander, I didn't really go very far because of my time on training wing. And the job is training, not sort of jumping on one of the aircraft carriers and going out to, you know, that, that was part of the thing you had to sort of say, well, I can't do that. I can't do both. And that's how it worked. How hard was the SES training? <laughs> Our SES selection training... Um, as I say, I would, I would think if you weren't fit, and I've seen this a hundred times, um, it would be really hard. The physical side of it, I didn't find that hard. I've got to be totally honest. It was hard. I'm not being big headed here, but I was fit. And, you know, when you start doing the marches, you probably heard about day after day after day, and your body's getting worn down. I was prepared for that. So a lot of it is in there. The physical side, you know how fit you are, you know what you can carry, you know what you're supposed to do. 
So you do all those, um, uh, and then you go on the jungle training after it, which you're already worn down after the first month. Your body is completely worn down. Then they send you to the jungle, where that is, that's hard, really hard work in the jungle. So your body's being worn down yet again. You know, so you've got week after week after week, you have to make the exact time and you have to do this, but you don't know what they are. So really, you have to sit down and go, I've got to go for this because I'm not being told I have to do this one in 12 hours. I don't know if it was eight hours or 13, 14 hours. So you have to really physically, you know, as fit as you think you are, you really have to put that into practice. And this here has to take over at times because you get tired that's designed to do that, you know, um, you day in, day, you can't take, oh, take a day off today, that doesn't work. So you had to just get that mindset for the next day when you finish the first day, second day, but you knew that was going to go on. I know people have gone on that course and day one, they've drawn all the kit out, put it on, everything. Day two, they're handing it all back in, it ain't for me. Right, but the more you go through the course on your selection, the more you're totally getting um, worn in, worn down. Since a hundred people show up, 80, 80, 90 people show up for selection. Day two, it's already being whittled down, and by the end, you have about eighty there. You might only have fifteen at the end of it. And at certain times, people go, "Stop for me! It's not for me! It's not for me!" And the ones who want it, just put the head down and go, and go and get it. What made you keep going? Um, well, my name is Fermin. I only found this out afterwards. Um, and unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, it's part French, Ferminus, and it means steadfast and resolute. Okay. So because of what I've done and come through where I came from and think of the times that were behind me, I've been pushed forward. I just knew and wanted to get to the end of it and get the Varian badge, you know, the winged dagger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted it. Um, and that, everything else aside, that's the type of person that I am, still am to this day. If I want it, I've got to go and get it. Um, you know, it's, you've got ups and downs in that. Of course you have. Make mistakes? Yep. Learn by your mistakes? Yeah. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I'm living proof that sometimes you don't live by your mistakes. Learn by your mistakes. But overall, out of all the, um, everything I've had to do in my life, nothing's been given to me. Not a thing. I've had to go and get it. Um, it's cost me in other areas. Fine. But I've got this. If I want it, I have to go and get it. What's the hardest part about SAS selection? <clears throat> well, I've always said this, some people think I'm nuts. You know when you have to go in the vehicle in the morning from Hereford out to the training area? A couple of hours. When you finish your training, you're running over the hills and come back, have a cup of tea or something. You've got to get that vehicle back to Hereford to get back in the vehicle the next morning. To, I, I hated that. <laughs> I, I, send me on the hills and run me up and down the hills all day. But they're looking, looking at the back of that vehicle and go, no, back to Hereford. Up first thing in the morning, back in the vehicle, back out to the hills. Relentless, non-stop. It's changed now, I think, because they don't go backwards and forwards to Hereford. They're much closer. But for me, that was the, the worst part. Um, the physical side I enjoyed. Um, as I say, I mean, I was fit. I prepared myself. And if you do your preparation, it really helps. Uh, it's no good bluffing it, not at all, because you've got one body... And it's your body that's got to take you through that. So I'll be honest with you, I've said it lots of times, 
getting in and out of that vehicle nighttime, daytime, nighttime, for one day after another after another, I just think, how many hours are wasted there? <laughs> backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. For me, that was probably the worst part. What's the main ingredient for people to pass SAS selection? Because you've probably seen men who you thought he's going to do well, and then he probably pulls out after the first day. What was the main connection that you've seen the people who did kick <clears throat> one and pass? Um, well, I know people who went there, they came from Germany, funny enough, because they could get a pass for a couple of weeks back in the UK. So basically when they came back here, they didn't go back to Germany. They could hand their kit in day two and go back and enjoy yourself for a couple of weeks. But the people who prepared, um, it's funny, as you're going through your selection process, yeah, you've got a big nucleus to start with. You can see it dwindling every day. You can see the bed over there is empty. I had somebody in here yesterday. Oh, the bed over there is empty. Those two over there are empty. And that's the people who are falling by the wayside. I'm not being funny, but the people who passed, and I mean this, all of them, 99% of them, when they finished their training, went out and had a beer. All the guys that were on pills and tablets, bodybuilding, they failed. To me, that told me a story. Okay? I didn't touch anything like that. Beer? Yeah. Go out. And those are the guys that actually passed at the end. So let your hair down. Be on parade next morning. And I don't mean go out and get wasted. Go out, relax, talk about it. Have a couple of beers. Go back and sleep, get up in the morning. The people who were, in, in my day anyway, you know, oh, I'll go to bed at 10 o'clock because I'm a good lad. They're the ones I never saw much of at the end. And so that's coincidental, maybe. I don't believe in coincidences. So I think you can see what I'm trying to say mm -hmm. is you've got to be able to mix it a bit. Balance. Yeah. And of course, at the same time, you're bonding and building that friendship from with people that have come from all different parts of the British Army. The intelligence corps, engineers, artillery, drivers, cooks, bottle washers, all of them. But you find that that nucleus very quickly comes down. And then after the jungle phase, it comes down generally again and so on, all the way through to the very end. And you're left with... Um, well, what's left basically and that's what I found see the people who failed did you ever speak to them and ask why they quit um, normally they've gone very quickly embarrassed no they're sent out you know if they uh, you know uh, mine is at least they've had a go and tried it so I'm okay with that why shouldn't I be you know, if you've had a go and fail, it doesn't mean to say anything apart from I've had a go and it wasn't for me. That's, I think that's a fair enough comment. Um, but yeah, I did speak to uh, quite a few people afterwards, um, certainly through the football circles when I met them again. And um, they tell you the different stories, you know, um, how they didn't like interrogation, how they didn't like this and so on. You know, the, everybody's different. I'm just lucky that I got on the way I did and just pinned my ears back and thought, yeah, if you fail, you've had a go. So it's not a crime to fail. Um, some people got a second chance, depending on what they failed on. Um, some got through on a second chance. Some failed yet again, but they tried. But it's not for everybody. What was the interrogation? like an SAS selection? Um, well, it's quite realistic. You know, you do your um, escape and evasion. You're thrown out in the middle of the moors in what you stand up in, an old great coat, bit of string around the middle of it, a pair of trousers. Uh, I think in those days we had enough to make one emergency phone call in your pocket. But you knew that when you were out there, you weren't quite sure how long you were going to be out there for. 
It's days on end. All the weather conditions, you've got nothing. You haven't got any food. And this is over the parts of the Brecon Beacons, um, which is quite, you know, unforgiving at times. The weather can be changed just like that. Soaking wet one minute, dry the next minute, trying to find somewhere to hold up where you, the dogs won't find you. And they, they have a hunter force, depending on who it is. They have a hunter force, it chases you. They've got all the kit, they've got the Land Rovers, they've got this, that and the other. You get an A to B, you've got to make that rendezvous point, such and such. You haven't got a map. So, see, but you're being chased and they've got all the kit. You know, they've got all the um, radios, everything. You are generally paired up with somebody um, and off you go. And every now and then you'll meet an agent if you make that contact and it'll give you a sandwich. Okay. Um, if you didn't make the come, <laughs> you didn't get the sandwich. But the farmers are all briefed. Okay. They're told that there's an exercise on. And if they see anybody, they have to report it. So you've got them as the local, what would be the bad guys in reality if you're escaping evading. So you've got them out there playing their game as well. So once again, <laughs> I can laugh at it now. And I can see myself in that great coat, um, soaking wet, filthy. You find somewhere you're not allowed into farms. <clears throat> you're not allowed in. You could sneak in. You're not allowed in. Because they'd come and search them, the farmer will get you, you know, dogs, you know, sniff at uh, the German shepherds and stuff. Uh, you know, they were all part of the hunter force. And you had to escape and evade. And then when they catch you, eventually, I didn't get caught. Quite a few people didn't get caught. Some did, but they take you in. Then once you've picked up, obviously you have to hand yourself in at some stage. Um, and then they take you back having been worn down again after all that time. And then they put you through the interrogation phase. Um, different interrogators, um, you know, asking you questions, obviously. All you're allowed to do is number, rank and name, and date of birth. That's it. You say any more. And generally, that's against the rules. So some people failed that as well. Um, so, you've, but you don't know how long you're going to be blindfolded. You don't know how long anything. You just don't know. And then one time they come up and say, right, this is no duff. You know, you're finished. So either you pass or fail, but you don't know. <laughs> you know, so you go off um, to the next hurdle, you know, and then somebody will work out, you know, okay, it's past that. And so you can go on to the next phase. And so on. So it's it's all difficult. It's all mind games. Um, but you have to go above that. And you know, I did mine. Some people, as I say, they, they said too much. Speaking to interrogators, um, and really, uh, that's the way you, you've got to play the game. You know, uh, and if you look at it that way, uh, you know, uh, that, that's the only way to do it. What's, what was it like for you when you passed? When I passed? Yeah. Did you feel a sort of relief? Yeah, no, the, the guys I passed with, actually, <clears throat> we had quite a good um, bond together. When you've been through that with a certain amount of guys, you see them on the outside dwindling, and you've got the guys that are left. To this day, some of us are still good friends. There's a lot of yeah, been and gone, you know, passed away and stuff. But when I passed it, uh, go back to then, it was great because at the end, when you actually knew that you had passed, you never knew anything. If you turned up the next day for training, you knew you hadn't failed. They didn't come up to you at the end of the day and say, okay, you passed the day, Rusty, it's okay. Nothing like that. So you've got to, you know that you're being watched by experienced instructors all the time, waiting for a false move. 
But when you actually pass and they're told, okay, such and such, you've passed, then that's such a relief. Um, and most of the guys I knew at the time um, just went out, uh, got pissed basically, and I had a laugh. At me. All that weight comes off your shoulder. Um, so it, it's just, it's a different feeling. Because you've seen, you know, say some people are oh, masochist. This, no, it's not that. You've done it for a reason, but now you know you finally got there, and only when you get there can you actually go, you know, um, and really let yourself go a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what that's exactly what happened, you know, um, with me and most of my mates. That's what happened. So see, when you pass SAS selection, does things automatically just change within, or are you straight And How does it work? Do you get rest, or are you ready for operations? How does it all work? No, I mean, I got through November 77 because I didn't have to do the parachute course. Because you had right done it? at the very end, because I'd already mm. done that. <clears throat> so you got, you ask what squadron you want to go to, I think most people who asked for the squadron that they wanted got that choice and whatever they asked for. So it's quite accommodating. Um, not always, but I got what I wanted. Um, a few of my friends got what, you know, the same guys. They got what they wanted. So th that helped. And then when you think... You know, I've never said anybody who passes selection is an SAS soldier. And to this day, I still say that. Because, you know, like a tradesman has to go and do his trade with somebody. You know, I'm an electrician, right? You, you, son, you go and work with him for such and such. Get a bit of experience. So I just thought, well, I passed. But I'm not going to go around saying, you know, I am the big I am. You know, it didn't work like that. So, when I went to B Squadron, the following day, the guys that went to B Squadron were introduced to the already members of B Squadron. Some of them been there a couple of years, some of them been there one year, some of them been there ten, eight, nine years. So, they're all sat there and you get introduced, you know, just come off selection, such and such, you're in that troop, you're in that troop. Four troops in a squadron, mobility troop, air troop, mountain troop, <clears throat> and uh, a boat troop. So, so I got mobility troop, which for me was great, exactly what I wanted. Um, once you're introduced, there's no fine anything. It's, um, the sergeant major says, right, <laughs> you, 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 us, the new guys, go over to the quartermaster's store. Get your burying belt. I come back. I said, "There's no, no well done. There's no, nothing. No celebration. Nah, nothing." So, you guys get over to the quartermaster store. Um, pick up your burying belts. Come back. I'm gonna tell you what's going on. That was November. December. Obviously, we had the break, as you always do, Christmas break. Getting ready for the following year, whatever was going to catch up the following year. So that was it. That's your introduction. A quick, hi, uh, his name is Rusty, such and such, Pete, and, then, uh, and that's it. Off you go. <laughs> you go over the, and the quartermaster looks you up and down the line, you go, yeah, bury and belt. Yeah. Not handed to you. Just just chopped on the cap to pick that up and go back. You take your bury back, you shape it. Put it in water, make sure it's not sticking out here, you know. Um, put your kit on and go back and join the squadron. From there on in, you're integrated into your troops and then you're part of the squadron. How many were in the squadron? Sorry? How many were in the squadron? Um, in my day, yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't follow them these days. But in my day, uh, altogether, you'd be looking at about four troops, maybe 60. Then you'd have a few attached arms like scalies, well, equipment scale as we call them but signals attached and so on 
um, which you need. They're, they're good guys. Um, and you would be looking at a squadron strength of 50. If you had more than 15 in a troop, I suppose you were doing really well because there wasn't that many numbers in my day. You know, so you had four squadrons with 15 in a troop. That would give you, what, 15, 30, 60, 40, 240 guys throughout the regiment. You'd have all the other ones on the outside who'd been there and got different jobs throughout. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how that went. So see, when you're, you've passed selection, I know there's some things you can talk about and some things you can. Um, what was the first kind of mission or operation you can talk about you went on? Um, well, my first one in 78 was Northern Ireland. Uh, I was there for six months. How was that? It's okay. Um, there's certain stuff you can talk about and can't. And basically, um, the Northern Ireland side of it is or was in those days quite interesting. Working alongside different units, working alongside the police, were doing different types of jobs, want going specifics, uh, undercover work, all that type of stuff as you'd expect. So that was the first six months. Um, five, five months altogether, basically. But you'd spend them three weeks training um, and get on with it. What was it like? Was that the first time you'd seen people bombings and shootings and people dying? No, no. No, no, I'd seen them in the early 70s. Uh, so you were so, used to it then? Yeah, yeah. Um, i seen it when, I, you know, we did the Belfast when I was in 4-9. And the commandos? Yeah, I didn't do the full tour. But in 4-9, I did a couple of tours. And that was um, the city centre. If you remember back in the early 70s, um, the, the, the bombings and stuff that were going on, especially in the Belfast city centre, the markets area, um, the shootings and stuff. Quite more or less first to respond along with the police because that was the, the job, was the city centre. And, of course, that's when they had the old segments up in the city centre, security all over the place. But there was always bombings and stuff in those days. So that was my introduction to it, really. Mm. So it, 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 this, when I went... After that, uh, different circumstances, different unit, different jobs. Did you feel different being in the SES than you did in the commandos? Do you see things differently? You're more aware, more paranoid or whatever? <laughs> Does things get heightened because of the stuff that you've then learned in the SES? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you're always walking around. To this day, I'm w walking around looking, you know, um, it's something... When you're looking over your shoulder all the time and being trained and going through it operationally, it's something that doesn't leave you. You know, uh, you walk out, you know, it's just strange because it's what you're looking for and the unknown. You know, as well trained as you are, you're still looking at everything figuring out what's going on around you, different surroundings, different <clears throat> different um, people, certain individuals um, to look out for. So all of that is all part and parcel of it, and that's where you have to really be on top of it to make sure that, um, you know, if push comes to shove, you've got the upper hand. What did you do after that? No, the, the ones after that were the SAS ones. Yeah. Which would be Northern Ireland with different parts mm -hmm. um, to be covered by different people. So mine was pretty much North Northern Ireland, um, up, up the top end, on the, you know, up that end, yeah. Where did you go after Northern Ireland? Um, different um, des deserts. Jungles. What's that like going from cold weather to warm weather? Are you prepared for that so it doesn't really matter? Or <laughs> Let me just say this. When we did the Falkland Islands in 1982, we were in jungle fatigue. Camouflage. There was no, there was nothing. They, they didn't change the kit and equipment. 
you went down there um, in what you were using in the jungle. But somehow, eventually, they got some Gore-Tex stuff, you know, the Gore-Tex jackets. Mm -hmm. They got some of that stuff sent to us. Um, but your kit you had in the jungle was the same kit you had in the Falkland Islands, you know, and it's it's cold down there. <laughs> it's it, it's really cold. So uh, the, the difference is you're lovely and warm in one place, sweating all day long. Uh, the other way you're freezing. Yeah, you know what? You're freezing to death um, because it is that cold. What was it like in the desert? Um, yeah, the desert. You know the. They tried to learn us to speak Arabic and, um, so you could train with the... It was like cross-training, you know, different... Um, their units with our units um, doing different desert scenarios and stuff. <clears throat> so that was quite, quite interesting. Uh, but it was normally... It was the desert of Oman which is very kind to the UK uh, forces uh, for the training facility, uh, Sultan of Oman Special Forces and stuff. A lot of them in, uh, back then were ex-SAS guys when they finished. So they were a very good setup um, way back then. How did the Iranian embassy rescue mission start? Well, because were you, were you known as a man with no gloves or something? That's it. What is the, what was that? <laughs> well, uh, it's in the book, <laughs> but actually, um, it started in the 30th of April, 1980. He finished on 5th of May, 1980, um, with the resolution, should we say. <clears throat> but the fact is that, like everybody else, I wore gloves all the time. However... After the six-day siege, when we were going to do the resolution, I, I was sat watching the snooker in next door in the in the um, Royal College of General Practitioners. So I was sat in there watching the snooker when we got the final call to go and rescue the remaining nineteen hostages. Predominantly, always I took my gloves off and put them down my body armor. But when I went down to sit down at once to watch the TV, because Cliff Thorburn was playing Alex Higgins in the final of the MC World Championship, quite a few of us were interested in snooker. I used to play it whenever we went abroad, whenever we could. So I sat there watching it and got the call. By then, I was the team leader, blue team. I was going to lead the assault. <laughs> so I got outside after they um, executed the hostage, I got outside and realised we was gone into position that my gloves weren't down there. I'd left them on the table so, uh, when I was watching Suka. That was the only time I didn't put them down my body armour. I got outside and we'd gone into position and then I realised but the, the picture that's in the book and the other pictures, you'll see a, a picture of me taken by the police snipers with a guy with no gloves in the middle. Well, that was me. <laughs> um, so that's how I got the name Rusty Fermin, the man with no gloves. Because everybody else in the team had their gloves on. People must have thought he must be a mad now, bastard with no gloves. Yeah, and it was caught in the group, my group, like that, with the weapon with no gloves on but you can bet your life i wasn't going to go back to pick the gloves up to go back out again so that's how that's how that came about do you get in trouble for that uh or is it not not a big issue it, well, it, it, nobody knew until the pictures arrived okay and um nobody really knew because it's not like today, you know, Zoom is across the world in five seconds. Mm -hmm. In those days, in 1980, um, yeah. they weren't interested in Rusty Fermin. They were interested in 
the assault that was being shown on TV, you've seen it probably a hundred times, you know, at the front, the, the, um, on the balcony and all that type of stuff. I was at the back door with my team, ready to go in through the library, which we did. So nobody would have seen that until later because it was never broadcast. However, once the pictures became available, which I've got, um, it was quite obvious that the police snipers had taken the pictures and it was the police who gave me the photos when we went to Scotland Yard. Um, a little bit later on, we made statements and stuff of what happened and who did what and so on. Um, and it, that's when it really became to lie that it was me. Um, and that was uh, at least a year later that I found out. I knew I didn't have any gloves on, but it wasn't broadcast anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's how that happened. How was that getting in? trying to rescue 19 people because did they, they already they killed a hostage as well did they not yeah they they killed Lavasani Lavasani was the Iranian pressure attache only a young lad um, and he was the pressure attache but he was sticking his chest out inside to the um, the six terrorists because and what they were doing, he didn't agree with it. So, cut a long story short, um, what they did is they took him down and put him, tied him to the, the banister inside the Iranian embassy, inside the front door. They tied him there, and then Faisal the second in command of the terrorists, we didn't know that at the time, this was afterwards, Faisal was the one who, having done that, we were, we were ready to go, but we weren't in position. When the shots were heard, bang, 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 three shots, nobody still knew if there was a shooting in the, inside the embassy. They heard the shots, but let's be honest, without proof of murder in my day, without proof of murder, Maggie Thatcher, yes, the three definite shots, but nobody was there to say, oh, they've killed somebody. So it was still a waiting game for us because if it had just been somebody firing three shots into the ceiling, as a bit of a come on, as they call it. Let's see what happens if you fire a few shots. <clears throat> well, it wasn't because the terrorists then took Lavasani out the front door and dumped his body on the step. And as soon as he did that, the, there's a couple of police cars went down with the stretcher to pick him up. That was proof of murder on UK soil. Maggie Thatcher gave us the, um, because don't forget, this was still a, a Met Police operation, okay? We were there to back up the police. Not a lot of people know that, but that's a fact. Um, so the police had dealt with it all the way through. Now we've got the body dumped on the step outside. Maggie Thatcher, um, obviously Prime Minister, it was then decided that the uh, Met Police would hand over the operation to the SAS. That was done on a scruffy old bit of paper, signed over. You now have control. And with that, we were informed, the teams, that we were going to go and rescue the hostages. Nobody knew what else was going to happen, but we had proof of murder. So we all got into the position. It took 16 minutes to get into position covertly. We didn't want to alert them if you could. Remember, they just killed somebody. It took us 16 minutes, top of the building, bottom of the building, balcony, back door, all the surrounding area. And then when we got the go, 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 it took 11 minutes from start to finish 
for our two teams, the red and blue team, Peace Squadron, to enter the building and um, rescue the hostages. At that stage, there was 26 originally. Some had been let out, one had been killed. There was 19 hostages remaining. So our job was to go in, and the mission was to rescue the hostages. That was the mission, rescue the hostages. Once we got that, we entered simultaneously all over the building. It took 11 minutes to clear 56 rooms. Um, five terrorists died, one terrorist got out, 19 hostages were saved. So the mission was achieved, and that took 11 minutes to start to finish. Was that when, because no one knew who the SAS was, is that correct? But because that, then it became world news that the SAS, <laughs> what you were all about, is, is yeah. that true or do people already know? No, no, the, I mean, I've been in the SAS three years before I realised where it was. <laughs> you know, <it's>, um, <laughs> it, that, that's, um, that is true. People had heard about the SAS, but that operation is said to be the most iconic um, SAS rescue operation, especially to be filmed and on UK soil. Did you feel extra pressure on that? Yeah. Because they'd killed someone as well? Yeah. What would happen if they'd killed someone else when you were coming through the windows and the doors? Would you have got fucked for that? Well, you never know because, uh, you know, <coughs> it's it's amazing these day, this day and age. But what I'll say is that in that day, after six days waiting, the guys were like Coral Springs. You know, let me go. Let's do something, you know. Um, and that's exactly what happened. We were allowed to go and do it. We were told to go and do it. And we did it. And the, the question he asked about the... Um, is, it, is this when it, the forefront, the SAS come from there to there? Mm -hmm. It was like a benchmark, if you if you like. It raised the benchmark, and people all over the UK had, had witnessed what had gone on. So there was a new camp built, much more heightened security than ever before, because in the old days, you could go in the front door of the camp as a civilian, walk through it, walk out the back door in the old camp. But now it's, you know, but in my day after that siege, that's when it, everything was heightened. See if you've got in full control of the siege in day one, would you have done the exact same on day one? Um, we'd have waited until... I mean, it was see the, the same, what people don't realise is they got what they came for, massive publicity all over the world. But then, had they just put their hands up and walked out, they would have been arrested and probably gone to jail for thirty years. Um, so, as the the one guy that did get out, you know. Um, so he, he got out alive, but got in prison for 30 years and got out after 28 years. They would have got the same. But instead of that, they had to execute somebody to go that step further. But they didn't need to because all they ended up doing was getting five of them killed, one of them arrested, and we got all the hostages out, all 19 of them. So it didn't... It, Yes, it got them a lot of publicity, but it didn't do them any good, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and they, they, they got exactly the same publicity anyway. But I've got to say that the leader, um, he wasn't, um, it, it looks like he wasn't a strong character of the terrorists I'm talking about, um, you know, and, that, and that's cost them. See when you were going through that then? See when, did you feel, did that enhance who you were? Or did you just feel the same with the world news and being heroes? And did that 
make you feel any different or was it just because what the SAS do is it just you don't really feel for call? No, I mean basically um we took a stroll back to camp, you know, that night, the fifth of May, after we'd spoken to Maggie Thatcher come to say thank you, well done, along with um Dennis Whitelaw. And uh, Dennis Thatcher, sorry, Maggie Thatcher and William Whitelaw, the home secretary. They come to say thank you over at Regent's Park Barracks. After that, guys with their vehicles, two or three would go off that way, that way, and just take a nice easy drive back to Hereford. No flashing lights, no nothing. And um, I've tried to find it lately. There's a cafe on the 417. Um, it was, a, it was a, a burger bar, basically, in those days. <clears throat> and we just stopped there on the way back and um, had a cup of coffee and tea or whatever, a burger, and then rolled into camp, I don't know, one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, something like that, put the vehicles away, uh, turned up the next day. So, But when we turned up the following day, we had a couple of days off. Um, you know, so I, come, I think it was two two days off. Yeah, I was going to lay hair down a bit. Um, and that's exactly what we did. Do you get extra pay for doing stuff like that, or is it just <laughs> monthly all the same? No. <clears throat> I think Maggie Thatcher, I think she'd give us a pay rise a year later. But actually, no, it, it's, a, it's a day job, isn't it? You know, you volunteer for it. Um, so it's really a day job, and you don't get any extra pay, not at all. Did, did you get a buzz? Do you get a buzz? Like butterflies or a buzz that you're going to do some mad shit, um, or does that again? Are you just cool no, to it? No, I don't get like that really. Um, are you taught it, not uh, to show any nerves or any fear? I, I don't. At the time, I don't know anybody who was. Yeah, basically, six days is a long time to hang about. No sleep. A, a bit of sleep if you 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 can't take your kit off. You know, I didn't shower. Um, so you've got all your kit on all the time. Smelly and you've bastard. Got your weapon, your weapon, your, <laughs> you've got your weapon in there, at arm's length, right mm -hmm. beside you. Um, you've got your gas mask there. The rest of the kit is on you, just in case. Um, we did have two teams, so we could have a break. We couldn't go anywhere. What we say a break is 12 hours on standby. 12 hours because there was two teams but we were right next door we were in 1415 princess gate the iranian embassy of 16 princess gate so that there was quite good so if we got the go you could be out of there next door as i said very quickly so you just watch snooker um and prepared for whatever you can only prepare yourself so many so much um and the ironic thing was that day bank holiday monday 5th of may i was supposed to be playing footballs for westfield football club in hereford in a cup final but the guy who i was playing for andy his brother stood in for me and scored the winning goal how about that nice that is a god's honest fact Mm -hmm. So I'd missed the cup final, but I was seen by millions on TV because of what happened. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How do you handle fear? Do you become um, do you become fearless, or do you still feel it at times? No, I do a talk on um, harnessing fear. Um, I think it's fair to say I'm not frightened of very much, and if I am, I don't know what it is because I'm not like that. Um, the this, this stuff I've done, some of it's been quite hairy, but I tend not to dwell on it. I know that when I jumped out that helicopter into the South, uh, the Hercules, into the South Atlantic, the Falkland Islands conflict, I know that when I jumped out there into the raging, sort of freezing cold sea, hoping to be picked up. I remember thinking I've just flown all the way from Ascension Island, refueled a couple of times in midair. I just want to get out of this aircraft. 
So when we got into the, you know, it jumped in, it was a snowstorm. Couldn't see the sea. Then you could see, then you couldn't see it. I'm thinking, I'm hoping somebody's going to pick me up out of the South Atlantic, along with the other guys in the squadron. People say, well, that must be it. Well, it was, but it, because I had to do it, I just wanted to get it over. The thoughts of what happened afterwards, like, fuck, did I really do that? And that's how I handled it. It's um, it's strange, but it's fair to say there's not a lot that I'm bothered about. I mean, people say, you're mad. I'm getting older. Okay, I've got people around me that help, and they've got good ideas, which I still listen to, even though they think I don't. Um, but I do. Um, but I'm always making my mind up and thinking, you know, what if? What if? Um, would I have been in the SAS really if I wasn't going to do something? I've never been asked to do anything that I haven't done. I think that says it. Never. Do you get emo do you ever cry when you're in the SAS? Get emotional, just a release? Um, no, I cried after the SAS. I don't remember crying in it unless we had lost a game of football. <laughs> which, uh, which actually, People dying left, no, right, and centre, not a fucking no, tear shed. No, but what I can say is we never lost many games of football, I can no. tell you that. Um, <laughs> but no, seriously, um, not not while I was serving. Sometimes, um, you know, um, when you think back and you have these flashbacks and stuff, and you think, it, what could have been, you know, but it wasn't. It wasn't going to be my day. You know, it's somebody else's day. You know, we lost all those guys in one helicopter crash in the Falklands. There's 19 of them, I think. Huge loss. Really good SAS guys and attached. All gone like that. It wasn't my turn to be in that helicopter. But it could have been. What's it like to lose brothers? <clears throat> um, I've lost a lot. And I'll be honest with you, in the last two days, I was just saying earlier, there's another three gone in two days. So I have to think, well, we the good times. And we're all in that order. One day, it's your day. So you have to, do, you know, give them the best send-off you can. Remember the good times, because they're not going to come back. But still think there are some good times around the corner. Might be in a different way, different light, but they're there if you can make them. So it's not a nice feeling, and I would think probably um, I've lost more than maybe, I don't know, I'm not being facetious, maybe all of you together. You know, good quality, you know, gone. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. You're going to get that, though, especially serving nearly 30 years. You're going to see so much torment, misery and pain. When was, what's your most closest you've ever been to being killed yourself? I'm not quite sure, really, because you don't know what's around the corner mm. <laughs> um, or what you've just missed. But, you know, you've, uh, you've turned up late or later when somebody's jumped through a window or if you look at it like that or shot at, um, you don't know where the bullet's gone. So that's only happened to me um, one or two occasions, one of them in Northern Ireland. But actually, it's, I don't know is, is the answer to that. No, to give you a correct answer. Mm. I'm not quite sure, but when you look at what you've done and other people that have been killed on it, you're only around the corner from it. You don't know, you could have been part of that, you know, if you were two minutes earlier, three minutes later. Yeah. So that's really, you know, it's... I tend not to look back on it, but once I've been there and done it, I'm looking forward to what's next. But I'll never forget the guys that I know and have lost, and some of them, how they've gone. You know, um, and laughing and joking one minute, and you're bumping the sea in the next minute. 
What's the hardest part of being a soldier? It, I keep saying in my day because I've seen the way it's changed, the army. So today I've got no idea. But back then, the hardest part, I've always, remember I wanted to play football. I ended up in the SAS. I ended up on the team there that took out the embassy and saved the hostages. And I think to keep the discipline and keep respect as best you can from those around you is very difficult because, you know, I know guys that have been, they got thrown out, even when they've been in the regiment for three years, you know, they've done something wrong and been booted out. Um, what do you think? I might have done that myself sometime, but I'm lucky I never got caught. You know, it, it works like that. It's the same in any walk of life. So I think discipline and gain, keeping respect and credibility, to try and keep them, certainly when you're serving, is a, a, a big key to everything, really. You need them, you, the guys you work with in difficult situations, dangerous situations, you know that you have to rely on them. They know that you have to rely, sorry, that I have to rely on them, but they have to rely on me because you normally work in small teams. So that, that I think, and I'm talking about maybe different than being in the artillery, but I've been there and I've done that. I've been in the SAS and done that. And certainly at the top end of the tree, no disrespect to anybody else, but at the top end of the tree, the SAS, you know, you'll be found out if you don't come up to the mark. And if you get found out, you're gone. Yeah, you talk about the top end of the tree. The SAS are the elite, but being at the top comes a great deal of sacrifice. How hard is it for loved ones and relationships to then, because you've got, how do you block all that out to try and do a job, come home safe to then the worry that everybody else has around you to make sure you're going to be okay? Well, I would just say that I was a soldier first, okay? And, you know, if you're a soldier, you're expected to do things that are not run-of-the-mill, day-to-day stuff. So you should be in a position, to, for me, to block it out. You know, um, when I went to the Falklands, I didn't know if I was coming back. But my son was only six weeks old. So, <laughs> just don't know. How do you switch that off? Sorry? How do you switch that off then to try and do the job and stay focused to then not worrying about possibly never seeing your son again? Well, it's hard to say how you switch it off. But if you remember, it was on about mentality. This part here... I still believe if you haven't got that mentality, you're in the wrong job. So when you, as I say, when you do this, um, the Falklands, for example, you're doing it because you pay to do a job to help to try and protect others. So to switch off, you don't switch off totally, but you have to think, what am I here to do? I can't say, oh, I might get hurt, I've got to go home. It's not going to work like that. You have to go and do the job and then hope <clears throat> that everything goes okay. What's it like to take a life? Um, not pleasant, but at least as long as it's not me taking my own life, you have to put up with it. Do you see a lot of suicide in the, with soldiers? Yeah, I've seen a lot, yeah. Um, SAS cars as well. Yeah, it's not pleasant because you know them. And then you just wonder what could have been done if maybe the warning signs. You see, not so much when you're serving, but when the guys come out, 
you're just another number. Next. You've done your bit. You saved you 27 years. Next. It's a conveyor belt. And it's not nice. I, I know quite a few have uh, hung themselves, you know, um, jumped out of an aircraft with no parachute on purpose to kill them. I, you know, I know all this. I've seen it. Could they have been helped? Who knows? Is help available? Well, it might be in certain forms, but certainly I don't know it's ever been volunteered. You know, and people have had to put up with that. It's just strange that you have to be able to deal with it in your mind. Does party ever feel used? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. But more than that, I've seen other people used. You just, you know, you, you, when you're in there, this SAS, Special Air Service, you feel, when you come out, you might still be special in certain ways, but there wasn't anybody really give a toss about what you got up to. Yeah, we do a lot of homeless stuff in Glasgow. The majority of men who are on the streets are ex-military. Well, I'm a patron of three charities, unpaid. One of them is a homeless veterans project in Scotland. Donna and um, Alex, they, they run that. They asked me to become a patron for them. I've done a few events and stuff. Um, you know, so I, I, I know what you're saying. And I've worked with them. And I was also an ambassador for Pilgrim Bandits, all the amputees. I did lots of events for them to help raise money in the early days. So <clears throat> I'm also a patron for the Victoria Cross Trust. You know, and... Um, Veteran 180, they're all veterans, and a lot of them are injured. And it's to help to try and give them a life back together to make them feel they're still part of society. You know, there's nothing worse than being cast aside. Well, these guys are helping them all the time. So in my own time, that's what I've done. I don't get paid for it. But that's what I do. So you've been a soldier for nearly 30 years, ready to die for your country, putting yourself in the front line. What do you think of wars now that you've got a bit older? Is it still the same mentality? You're there to do a job? Or do you look at things a bit differently? If probably I'd known what was going to happen to this country, I signed on, as I said, 15 and then slowly, it's not a country I like anymore. That's all. How so? Because of what's happening. Um, I'm not racist, but with this immigration stuff and everything, I put my life on the line for my people. They've come here. They take the slots of our people, soldiers on the streets. They get the accommodation. They get this, they get that. Ours are still running around trying to take anything that's given to them. You've seen that Bibby Barge and stuff. Oh, it's not good enough for us. Our guys would have that. Gladly. The soldiers on the streets. So me, if they want to come here, you know what? Let's start a new unit. Let's put them all in the unit and say, right, go and fight for this country. Let's see how much comes out of that. I'll tell you something, not a lot. Okay? Brand new mobile phones, bank accounts. Our soldiers haven't got that. Do you think Britain's getting weaker? Britain, with the. I don't know what to make of it. It's so bad, the leadership we haven't got. How many prime ministers we had in the last couple of years? It's all about themselves. All about themselves. They look after each other and the rest, sod it. 
let them fend. But they can't do enough for these, the immigration that's going on. They want a mixed-race society by 2030. Okay? How did the world... Um, world, uh, what do you call it, um, economic forum. Why do they want rid of 8 billion people in this country, not this country, in the world, to get it down to something like yeah, 800 million? Depopulate. Why is that? Easier to control. Exactly. So why are they using chemtrails in the sky? You know the chemtrails? Hmm. You know what's there about? Of course. Yeah. The country needs to wake up. It's already too late, by the way. But you know what? You might be able to help save something. The country is absolutely screwed. Totally. Yeah, but they don't even now they don't even want men anymore. They're trying to take okay, away masculinity, they're trying to promote fucking trans movement. They're trying to weaken man. They're trying to weaken people. We're already fucking weak. And well, the people are soft or not. Because the power of the people is so fucking strong. Yeah. If people unite, they can fight against anybody. That's, that's what I would... Doesn't happen, though. No. What have I been saying? It doesn't happen, though. No. I still go, you know, and tell people, you know, that this is going on. You know, everything. You know, the, the child trafficking. Everything. That's the biggest. I'm on all of, all, yeah, all yeah. of it. But you know what? You can mention it on TV, but instead of them coming up with this, um, the stories, they'll mention it, but they'll never go into it. No, they'll mention it and deflect it with another shady exactly. story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what you know. That's exactly <clears throat> what goes on. You want to stop the immigration? Put me in charge of it. I'll do exactly what the Aussies do, and it's worked for them. They won't do that. So Ellen Braverman has got no idea. She comes up with words and fancy. Not just her, by the way. All of them. One after another. Talk. 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 Change the policy. Change. Change. You know what? Are you telling me that this country could defend itself against the Germans as we did in the Second World War and we can't stop? Some Mickey Mouse guys coming across in, you know, um, rubber boats. Now, you turn them around, he's taken back. The fact is that it's everywhere. So they're flooding the market and saying, oh, well, you know, um, no, the bad weather's come in, which is a godsend, I hope. Um, and then they whinge and whine when a boat gets turned over. I read something yesterday that there was 800,000 coming to the UK to start a war. Yeah. Well, there probably is, because whether it's 800,000 or not, the fact is, my, me, you see the floating barges, mm -hmm. and they then put them into the hotels and so on, and they're building extra prison camps. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> If I'm not mistaken, that's going to be the likes of us that go in the prison camps and the barges, and they'll take over. They'll have the mixed race, which is what they want, and they have the controllers, that's Klaus Schwab and the rest of them at the top. Think about it that way. Yep. Vaccines. How many people have gone? Why do they want rid of all those people? They've already said it. Then that's not hidden. They want the world population to be down by eight billion by twenty thirty. Oh, of course, more than percent. That leaves you eight hundred, eight hundred thousand mm -hmm. world population. Mm -hmm. At the moment, it's eight point, eight point eight billion, something like that. You look at Bill Gates. He's not. And that, he's not a fucking doctor. No, he's buying up all the land, isn't he? Yeah. In the states. Why is he buying the land? It's fucking scary, and people think you're a conspiracy theorist, but this causes They're deeper... Not conspiracies. What they need to do is, they need to wake up, okay, and say, you know what? Why would anybody say that as a conspiracy theory? It's not. It is actually happening. 
that's the they, they don't want to believe it. it control you've seen all this stuff down on um you know the the, the 5g yeah 5g totals. you know anything about that yeah, yeah yeah right they've got all the 5g right oh your computer no got never got nothing to do with that it's got to do with control for and minute cities trust me why are those lampposts 30 meters apart thereabouts because it's uh, it's only got, yeah, with the little aerials on the top mm -hmm. yeah everything is about control 20 mile an hour now in wales all the villages control mm -hmm. all the motorways 50 miles controlling you making you do what they want electric, getting you ready electric cars the if there's no electric cars, if there's electric Elec cars, they can shut you down any time. You know why they've got electric cars? Electric is free. You know that. They're charging Electric's in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's free. So they've got electric cars. The whole law, if you could just get the people to actually wake up and say, Christ, you know, it's not a conspiracy. And before long, it's going to be just too late. And that's the problem, yeah. because it's already very late. Mm -hmm. But all the people who are lying in their own nests, all of them, they're okay, because they'll be the ones that survive. Did you ever feel, now that you're seeing things differently, do you look back and feel as if you were part of the system? Yeah. Because you're just a number who's been then controlled, conditioned uh, to uh, their own yeah. program to do. Yeah. Who are you fighting for? When you question well, it. They're, they're bringing in people, aren't they? They, they haven't a clue who they are. Mm -hmm. So who's in charge of our borders? Because the people they're bringing in, they don't know. What do you think needs to change? Well, the whole of the establishment. And, you know, at the moment, I, I don't know what can change now because it's so late in the day. Um... But it's funny, you don't see many, if any, people who've led properly, you know, maybe ex-officers of some form, have got a bit of knowledge of the world. It strikes me, you know, and I'm, I say I'm not a racist, but you've only got to look at all the TV football presenters and rugby and this, that and the other. They've changed it to all female, and, you know, and... Uh, the, the, the colour side of it. Why is that? If you're good enough for the job, you have the job. Yeah, they're just trying to normalise stuff. It's just everything is going down the same route as they want it to do. Everything. You know, and that, if that doesn't change, it's never going to change. But it's a schooling system. From the day you were born, things are all backwards. Everything is backwards from cutting the umbilical cord at birth. Yeah. From giving people a name, a religion, a team to support. It's all labels. You're given, you're born under artificial lights. You're born, some mothers drugged up. Kids are coming out drugged up. So and then you've got the schooling system. And then you've got universities where you're paying money to do degrees to then go and work for the big corporations. They yeah. don't want free thinkers. They don't want individuality where you think for yourself and look outside the box and think, fuck me, what is going on? Because if you do that, the end question knows in power. They're trying to change the system where they're bringing fucking consensual sex down, transgender people speaking nursery stories to kids. They're just trying to normalise mad now, shit. It's not, not, none of it is normal. Yeah. You know, and what they're trying to do is make it that, that, that as well, I think, is actually a bit of a diversion as well to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Because they, they aren't doing anything about it apart from but the police dancing in the street when they should be on, on duty mm -hmm. with people with funny colours, you know, yellow, red, purple. Mm -hmm. what, what, I mean, what's all that about? You know, so the whole thing is it's beyond repair. Mm -hmm. And we haven't got the right people at all, in my opinion. We haven't got the right people in power at all. When did you start looking into all that? Um, probably, I've always had a, a bit of an interest, but um, probably the best part of three years, probably the best part of two and a half to three years, 
spending some time looking into it and why. And you probably saw, um, which is a good film, Mel Gibson's new film. Have you ever seen that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, it's, it, I can tell it's been dubbed, taken out, because all the other stuff with the child's... Tra- sound, of, sound of Freedom. Sound of Freedom. Ba- it's about... Uh, what's his name? Yeah. yeah. Tim, Tim Ballard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we watched that um, a couple of weeks ago. But I knew, you know, I nearly... I nearly sent a letter or an email to Mel Gibson because I used to work with him to say, well done, but I know they've taken stuff out of that film, you know, about the adrenochrome and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They've taken it out because you can tell by the length of the film and how long it is actually in the, in the they tell you how long the film is, there's about 20 odd minutes missing off it. Mm-hmm. And I went to see it the other week and that, that would really spook people. Yeah, but they say the world's run by fucking satanic evil it is. devil worshippers. We had a woman on yesterday, and the names that she was mentioning who are involved in the red rooms in London and the shit that they do towards kids and the people sitting on these fucking news channels and presenters that have been at the top of their games for 20 years. It's unbelievable. It's some dark shit, and they talk about Russell Brands. I don't have the answers about Russell Brand. Um, I don't know much about him. Yeah, actually. and the girls have spoken. I would never discredit any survivor that came forward, but... Um, anybody can make ac- accusations about any man. That's it right. doesn't mean fuck all. No. It destroys lives, media. Destroy lives, trial by media. Yeah. Russell Brand is speaking about mad shit now. He's exposing a lot of things about the vaccine and big companies and energies. And well, it, that's what it is. The, the pharma companies. Biggest organisation on the planet. Yeah. And the, the Ukraine war, as I said the other day, is the biggest money launderer since COVID-19. And it is. Yeah, they've took billions. It is. Was there, have we got any receipts, by the way? I don't think so. So it is. What do you think of the Ukraine war? What do I think? Roll on pure, yeah. <laughs> He yeah. seems to be doing a lot for his country, though, man. Well, if you have a look, if you have a look at what's going on in Ukraine, underground, have a look at that. What do you think of it when you look back and see... Like Gaddafi being killed. Gaddafi. Yeah. Same as they do with um Saddam. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly the same. Devalue the dollar. One of them. Devaluing the US dollar. Both cases. At least Saddam at that time, this is one of my th- it's not a theory. It's one of the things I've talked about is that at the time, they used the Scud missiles, didn't they, as a big excuse. Remember? Yeah, weapons of mass destruction. There weren't any Scud missiles. Yeah, there was none. Right. So the only way they could do anything, because of the threat, I think Saddam was going to use his own money, wasn't he? He was going to do something. He was coming away from the dollar. Yeah. That's when they got spooky. That's when they went and done what they did. And eventually they killed him. Same to some degree with Gaddafi. They couldn't have that. So if you look at it that way, it makes common sense. At least Saddam, they knew him, they knew how to work him. But actually, they couldn't have that happen. What do you think life is? <laughs> um, well, first thing I... Um, if I knew I was going to live this long, I'd have looked after myself, right? That's the first thing. <laughs> but seriously, it's not my life I'm worried about. I've got here. What I am worried about is the likes of the younger generation coming up, having their kids. I don't want to say it, but I'm going to. In my opinion, their life is going to be terrible. If they've got kids coming through with Seriously, you wait and see. You know, it's it's not somewhere, um, you know, I, I'd like to think, I look at this in 20 years' time, after 2030, you know, the Great Reset, they call it. You've heard of the Great Reset? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, after the Great Reset, which had maybe 200 years, people go, what are you on about? Just ask them. 
who built the Houses of Parliament with the tools they had all those years ago. How could that be possible? You get what I'm coming yeah, from? Yeah, yeah. The Great Reset is every 200 years. The reason it's every 200 years is why? Because any man, female, anything, isn't going to live to 200 to tell the tale. Okay? So, you have the Great Reset, 2030, big deal. Uh, World Economic Forum, what a bunch they are. Um, and they're the ones who are laying out all, all this stuff for the future. All of them. You know, Klaus Schwab and the rest of them. You know, um, and I, I honestly believe that I wouldn't, I feel so sorry for the people coming through. You know, would you advise anybody to have kids because of the mixed race stuff? Um, I wouldn't, <laughs> as simple as that, because what's around the corner can be horrific, but it's too late. What you need is, you need a whole part of us to stand up and take this to the highest level and just make as many people listen to it as you possibly can. Why do you think people aren't standing up though? Not as much, not as many as people should. Because it's sheep mentality. You've got leaders who lead, okay, and then you've got the sheep mentality. One sheep goes that way, they all go that way. Because they're not wide awake. Until they waken up, as I said earlier, it can't possibly change. Because they need to be awake to go down that system. Not follow the leader. Sorry, there are leaders, but they lead sheep. Now, 50 of them go that way and one goes that way. That's the black sheep of the family, right? So he's gone that way, making the correct decision. That's what they're doing. Control. We've talked about it earlier. Control, control, control. Once they control you, you'll do anything for them what they say. That's what they want. Good little boy. Pat on the head. Off you go. That's what they want. Too many people don't know. And as they flood the country, if they don't know, a lot of them can't speak English, they can't do anything. So those here coming in, they'll take over. You wait and see. Um, and then it will be too late because of the vast amount. As you say, what you told me before, we've gone on an island and stuff. I know that. It's a tester. It's a tester. You wait and see. That's a test. This place will follow. It's a bit bigger than Ireland. Let's test the ground, see what happens here. Mm -hmm. Trust me. When did you write your books, Rusty? 2010 for the Go, Go, Go. That was for the 30th anniversary of the siege. That one, 2017, the regiment. Um, and as you know, that one's been made into a film, Go, Go, Go. Mm -hmm. Six Days, Jamie Bell plays me in the film. Then the other one, um, My Life Up Until Leaving the Army, 1992. Does it bring back a lot of emotion? It, it, it did at the time. Yeah, it did at the time. Um, because memories, I'm, I'm lucky that I've still got a memory. Um, you know, sometimes you wish you hadn't. Because I can remember some really fine detail of stuff. And I find that, you know, um, it's interesting. But yeah. actually, sometimes you do think, you know, um, that uh, it's a real change, you know. Um, of course, lately, I met Sue. She's been a great help, a good mind. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we're on the same wavelength, that's the main thing. But we're only part of it. If you could get that nucleus, and some of the guys at the top, you know, they know what's going on. Yeah. And if you could just manage to crack that, 
and make some more people aware of what's actually going on. Uh, have you heard of the Dumbs Underground? Or so? uh -huh. yeah. They need to be aware. You know, you don't get that many kids, 100,000 in the US. Can't remember how many in the UK are going missing every year. How did they get reported? When do you ever see that written anywhere? You don't. It just isn't there. That's a lot of people to go missing a year with no reports. Uh, millions. There millions is. Millions of people, yeah. There is. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but nobody's bothered about it. Nobody. Because it's a big business, though. It's one of the biggest businesses. It's taking over drugs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's what, you know, what the dumbs are. Mm. How do they travel underground like that? They're not traveling overground. Somebody would find them. It's underground. Where do you go forward for the future, Rusty? Um, well, we're looking at sort of some, maybe a charity out, um, which we've talked about for quite a long time. Um, got some other stuff in the pipeline, totally away from the security side and stuff. Uh, we just that's going along as we as we talk right now for a change, and still trying to help you know the charities I'm involved in. And, of course, anything like we've just talked about the last, that is a big interest. I talk about it quite a lot. I mention it to people. Some people know about it, and it's like, okay. But in the main, you know, um, I've been, I've, I've, I've just been doing talk in America, uh, over in Texas. I've got another one, San Diego, December Got another one back in Texas again in um, April next year. And I've got some feelers out at the moment. You know, America look after their veterans, okay? Britain don't look after the veterans. Yeah. And I'm so impressed the way America is. I'd move there tomorrow. Rusty. All the best for the future. All right, mate. And uh, take Cheers. care of yourself.